in this podcast, you have the win against Bradford, the win against Watford. Oh my God, we've won three in a row. Want support? Curtis Fleming is there on the edge of the air. Fleming for That's Craig it. Hignett. Hit it, Higgy. Higgy hits the track. Abanelli coming alive again. Janino wants the ball played to him. Abanelli spots out. Hello and welcome to the Bora Breakdown podcast with Johnny Denner and Tom. We're the Bora podcast that gives you all of your Bora match day chatter in a podcast. And yes, we have won three games in a row, three wins in a week. Southampton last Saturday, Bradford during the week and Watford yesterday. Sees Bora got in the last 16 of the Carabao Cup and we're out of the bottom three. So the only way Woo-hoo. is up. Uh, Dana Moll, what is your one key takeout from the week? Um, probably that I'm seeing signs of progress, having previously seen signs of regression. It's amazing what a week or just over a week in football can do and can change in terms of your your mindset and how you receive a football team. I think we are showing signs that we're, we're clicking, we're connecting on the pitch, the players are understanding each other's roles again. And I think that's good to see. I don't know what the end goal of this is. I don't know what the destination is in terms of Borough's ceiling. I think there's still a lot of questions to be answered in that regard. But it's just good to see that we, you know, we've got wins under the belt, three consecutive ones, as you mentioned, and that Fortunes is starting to look a little bit rosier again. So all positive and hopefully this is the turning point for us now. Yeah, and to add a bit of philosophy to your key take out, Dana, the journey is the destination. Is that where we're going? <laughs> um, that is a bit of philosophy there. Uh, Tom, what is your one key take out? What are you, you going to go for? Yeah, I'm in mean, very similar. I am starting to think that we are starting to click now. Uh, again, not a perfect performance. Uh, I've, I've said the same about last week, but the signs are there. We've got a bit of momentum now, a bit of consistency in the team. Um See, we're not going to be able to take the full starting eleven into the next game against Cardiff, but um, yeah, it, it it is encouraging that you know we've not changed a winning team. Uh, everyone is in pretty much their their roles now, and it is working. Um, so yeah, hopefully win against Cardiff and and keep this going now. But um, you know, for all the stuff earlier in the season where we were playing passes behind uh, their their destinations and no one kind of really looked on the same wavelength. It's in a lot less of that now. Yeah. And I think for my key takeout is, I think it's just a relief. I think the relief that things are starting to come together a little bit more now. I don't think we are the finished article by a long shot. I think there's, like you both said there, I still think there's a ton of work that we need to do to try and get to the, the place that we were last, uh, were last year. I appreciate you can't really, I copy and paste it from from the previous season but what we can do is try to create a way of, of playing which is still effective and suits the players that we have i was really impressed that we've we've managed to win three and about uh three on the bounce because it kind of just alleviates all of the pressure that's happened over like the last few weeks and i know there's been a lot of frustrations uh with the fans and i know i can get it as well i totally get it because we were so good last year and then we have that such a poor start it can get on people's nerves and you kind of want to see results, but there's been a lot of changes and hopefully this is now we've, we've turned the corner and we can get going uh, again. Uh, but let's chat about the Bradford game first uh, because Borough made seven changes to the side and um, that beat Southampton with Glover, Smith, McNair, Balassa, Rogers, Silvera and Emmanuel latte laugh all coming in uh, to the starting 11. And it was another win for Borough and Danny, you made the, the trip uh, to the Valley Parade and, we we won and we, we won. It was fantastic. Mm. And you had an egg sandwich as well, which was disgusting. <laughs> Grow up. No, the egg sandwich was good actually. It was the it was the the cherry on the ice on top of the cake. But yeah, it was it was good. My first time at Valley Parade. It was a very interesting stadium in that the stand opposite was intimidatingly big. Like it wouldn't have looked out of place in Serie A. And then I looked to my left hand side and there was the most standard League Two stand I've ever seen. And then opposite us where we were there was the most non-league changing rooms of I have also ever witnessed so it was a very interesting stadium but very good though and the game itself 
I think it was as comfortable as you could get for Borough. It was a fairly routine victory. Uh, it looked like, again, we were really confident. I think even though Bradford are a League Two side, I was still really, really disappointed in them. They were rubbish, quite frankly, throughout the whole of the game. There was a point towards the end of the match where Borough were causing their own problems from playing out from the back. We were a little bit messy. But even with that, they had maybe a couple of corners, Bradford, but they couldn't muster anything um, against us. Brad Halliday was getting a bit of stick. Obviously, the former Borough Academy graduate. Um, I, I think that at one point, the Borough fans, it must have been like his friends or something were chanting. Um, he's magic, you know, just watch Halliday go as like a kind of piss tape because of how poor I think he was at parts. <laughs> so it was... Um, yeah, it was a, a really good night. And I think I previously said on one of the episodes that you can't get up for the cup against Bradford, but I was very much up for the cup in that way. And, and it was it was brilliant. And um, yeah, just I think, again, ties into what the one key takeout. I think we're seeing signs of progression. Yes, it was against a League Two side, but there's definite signs there that Borough is just starting to get things going on the pitch in terms of the um, combination play and individual performances as well. On the individual performances then, who stood out for you? I think my top three were Hackney, McGree and Barlas are probably in that order. Hackney is such a good player to watch because the ball is always under control when he's in possession it, it never gets away from him he never has a bad touch he's always it's almost like the ball's on a piece of string attached to his boot it's it's just very very nice to watch him travel with the ball and the goal that we scored latte last goal sorry the first one it was brilliant to see him shield the ball because you know one of the Bradford midfielders was effectively on his back at one point but he shields him out muscles him drives with the ball still and has that composure to wait for the run to be made by Latte Lath and to execute the pass that connects that run together. So, I mean, the shot, it, it shouldn't have been an assist because it shouldn't have been a goal because Harry Lewis should have saved that, um, supposedly one of the best keepers in League Two, but didn't see it on that showing. Um, McGree is just a fantastic footballer. We'll obviously get onto him and spotlight him later. And then um, Barlasa as well. Just There was a point in that first half where Barlasa played the ball he pinged it out to the opposite flank to Silvera this was from like a uh, near the left corner flag and the guy in front of me about two minutes later just looked back to that where he played that pass and gestured with his hand where it started and where it ended up like it it landed on the toe end of Silvera and I was he was quite clearly very impressed with that and almost probably surprised too because we don't really see that often with Borough players. And what we do, it goes out for a throw-in. Um, that's what Dan Barlasa can do when he was running the show. Little passes here and there when he was advancing in midfield, he was slotting them through uh, down the line for Lewis O'Brien and very good performance from him. Quickly, of the players that came in, I actually thought Rogers struggled a little bit. He struggled to keep the ball under a spell and to make the ball stick. The he miscontrolled it a few times. His first touch was a little bit off. If Borough wanting to persist with a number 10, I think they need to be stronger in retaining possession that way. Um, Crooks has been good at it, to be fair, uh, uh, of late. And then Latte Lath, you can tell that he needs a lot of coaching because even the shot that he scored from was crap. But it went in, so we weren't complaining. But he, he's got a lot in his build-up. I like his movement. I like his running. I like his strength. But I think in terms of that finishing, it needs a lot of work. It's all coachable, um, isn't it, for like a laugh? And, you know, yes, he's not going to get not getting the game time at the moment because of Corburn. But you can definitely see the signs. That there is something there. Just needs to, it just needs to keep progressing. But I just want to go back to a player that you mentioned in the, there. I want to bring you in, Tom. and just around Dan Balassa because... Everyone's seen really impressed with him in in the cup game. There's always been signs of of brilliance with Barlas. You know, his, his passing range is absolutely superb. What's your take on him? Because I think he's definitely got quality, but he just can't seem to get in the team at the minute. But why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, we can all see the quality that he has. I think in terms of his passing range, he's got something there that not really any of our other midfielders have. But the difference is the other midfielders for me uh, are a little bit better with progressing the ball and dribbling with it. Dana, I, I know you mentioned the the small passes he was doing when he was advancing at Bradford. I'd be interested to kind of hear uh, if he was doing much of the kind of advancing it himself and dribbling because I feel like that in the early games this season was possibly the part that was letting him down. Um, and 
I would say earlier in the season as well, uh, when he was obviously getting starts while Housen was injured, possibly always looking for that forward pass, didn't do him any favours in the championship. Um, so, sometimes a sm- uh, you know five-yard pass to the side uh, so we could retain possession uh, and someone in a better position could play the pass might have been a little bit better, but I, I feel like he was kind of playing riskier passes at that time. Um so yeah, I, I think it's the the progression in midfield that he's maybe missing, but also he's in the position now where he's behind Housen and Hackney, who have that understanding from last season. They are a good midfield partnership. And it's for him all going to be about when he gets his chance, which he probably will at some point this season, he needs to make that count and stay in the team. Yeah, and I'd agree with you as well. I think it's, it's hard to look past uh, Hackney and Housen at the moment. I think just with the last couple of games, you can't really change the winning team too much in the league. Uh, now, see, now we're winning team now that they've won two in a row. Uh, but it's the it's aspect of you know the confidence there, the team's starting to get a bit better now. Um, but I, I do like Dan Balasser a lot. I, I think he's a really good footballer. It's just it's just odd that we we just can't seem to to get him in, and it's just, just such a shame. It kind of strikes me of like Adam Forshaw when he was at Borough, um, when we had Ledbetter and Clayton. Ledbetter Clayton, brilliant. Unbelievable partnership. It worked. But I always really liked uh, Adam Forshaw. And I thought, you know what? He could definitely play in the Premier League. And he just has so much quality about him. And appreciate he did show that for, for Leeds. And obviously, he's had some injuries now. But you can just see the quality that these players have. And it's just, just such a shame where you have a really good player there and it just can't seem to, to fit in. But what's your take, Dan? Do you think that he can maybe get into the team? Or what, what do you think? What's your stance on Dan Balasser at the moment? Yeah, it's an interesting one with him because he's undoubtedly a good player in his own right. I mean, last season at one point he was joined top with Ryan Giles for assists in the league. So he's clearly a a creative player. He's just a different type of creative player. Like Tom said there about the, you know, is he carrying the ball? Not necessarily because that's not the style of player that he is. That's not his profile. He's more one that probably passes it along, then gets into those advanced areas through passing and then wants to play that ball through or is trying to play that ball from deep. I think Dan Barlasser was allowed to thrive against um, Bradford, or sorry, he he thrived against Bradford because he was allowed that time and space, whereas in the championship games, I feel like he's just wanted a bit too much time and he's not really been allowed that because you have championship midfielders that are on you and that are, effectively filling that space and forcing you to make those quick decisions if we move to a midfield three it might benefit him because Housen and Hackney or whoever's in front of him the two eights can take up a lot of that space and pull players out so yeah it's an interesting one with him because when you consider Lewis O'Brien I guess Dan Barlas is kind of fourth choice which is crazy because he could get he would probably get into a lot of most championship sides but yeah, I just I feel like in the championship he just wants too much time, and that's really been his his issue for me. But he's undoubtedly a good player. Hopefully, Borough can find a way to to fit him in. But you don't really change the whole team for one player, do you? So, and especially not a player that hasn't necessarily been a part of it this season. So, yeah, um, interesting one. But he's a good player. Hopefully, we can find a way to fit him in. Yeah, I hope so too. And obviously there was a really good win uh, against Bradford and that meant that Bora now face Exeter um, away in the Carabao Cup. I mean, we did tweet about uh, what would happen if we, we Yeah, I guess play. who tweeted that. Yeah, thank you very much, Malt Kirsten, us, uh, Dana. <laughs> um, but and now we're actually in the space of seven days. Uh, we now face Norwich, then Plymouth, then Exeter all in the space of seven days. And it's obviously it's the first time we, we've actually ever played uh, Exeter in a, an actual competitive match. I think Borough historian Sean Wilson uh, tweeted that. So shout out to Sean as well for, for that. But Tom, it's a lot of time on the road uh, for that week. Um, you know, you're up and down the country. How do you think that like can affect like Borough's performances? Because that is a lot. I mean, even for fans as well, whoever goes to all of those games deserves a knighthood. Uh, mm-hmm. for that. Um, but Tom, what do you think? Do you think it can affect Borough's uh, performances in, in that week? I mean, potentially, because we're probably not going to have too much time to even train that week. Uh, if if the plan is to, to travel back to Teesside and then kind of go back to these away games, I suppose an alternative idea might be to see if we can get some temporary training facilities down south for that week. I feel like we've 
possibly done that before. Maybe when we Warnock's had Warnock's the... staff. Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. go to Warnock's house, uh, play in his back garden. Or um <laughs> no, I feel like we potentially did it before when, when we had those kind of links with Chelsea. Um, although I'm I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but I, I feel like that's something I remember. Potentially, that that's something we could do if that was an option. Would save a lot of travel and make sure we get some more training time. But if it's not an option and it is the case that we have to keep coming back to Teesside, I feel like training time is going to be uh, very limited that week. And yeah, but, but I suppose on the on the other side of things, everyone might be constantly in kind of like game mode and uh, and and you know just like constantly kind of focused on on playing and and not really having t- too much time to to think about anything else yeah that recovery is going to be really key isn't it i think and i'm a bit concerned uh part of the amount like all those fixtures in one goal but i can once i think once it's done it's done isn't it and you know if we can get some facilities somewhere i think there's a lot of like um big like big clubs obviously um in the premier league that, that have like two facilities don't they? Like, i think manchester united have a one in, um kind of kind of and then uh one in London as well, you know. I mean, because they're a London based club and all that, so it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's all good for them. But we could maybe do that, you never know. Um, but let's let's move on because we've borrowed a word down south again. Um, and they won at Watford for the first time since 2012, uh, three wins in a week. And we made one change to the side uh, that beat Southampton with McNair coming in for Lenahan. Um, Tom. <laughs> What a big! I feel like this felt like a big, big win for Bora, especially to go somewhere where you haven't won in a while, and you know you're getting and you're getting the win. Um, but what was your overall assessment on on the performance for Bora? You know what? I kind of saw it coming um, when that started, about we hadn't won since uh, so what did you say, 2012? Um, 2012, yeah, yeah, because Bora had posted something on the morning, um, and certainly like, oh, Scott McDonald got him last time we were down there. It was like, well, oh, that's been a while. It wouldn't surprise me if we did that today, and of course we did. Um, you know, we'd be saying typical Borough if it was the other way around. So, wonder if all the Watford fans are thinking typical Watford. But no, it was um, like I said earlier, not a not a perfect performance by by any means. But the signs are there that it is clicking. We are doing a lot more of the basics right now. And obviously, to get off to as good a start as we did, um, I, I felt really confident, even when they conceded. Uh, no, even when they scored. Sorry. Um, I still felt confident that we were going to see it out and win. Not so much when they scored the second, because uh, when Martins came on at half time and they kind of looked on top for the around the first five, ten minutes of the second half, I thought, oh, okay, this might go the other way and we might be having another miserable podcast today. But um, no, fair, fair play to uh, to Borough. We, we've done well. We we kind of weathered the storm after, after conceding there and it was good for Coburn to get that goal as well, um, especially because five minutes before that, I was literally just saying, take him off for, for let me laugh. Um, you know, both both centre-backs on yellow cards. We can probably get one of them sent off here if he's running at him. But um, no, Coburn uh, obviously got his chance and, and took it. So it was really good uh, to cap the performance off. But I'm thinking more in terms of confidence and momentum, what that's going to do now. It does give us a platform to build from. And especially if we can go into Tuesday night against Cardiff on a high and and hopefully get a win there uh, at, at the Riverside as well, then all of a sudden that away game against Sunderland next Saturday doesn't seem as, as daunting. Um, I'm sure it still will be because they are pretty decent this season. But... Um, if, if we if we can kind of carry that momentum forward, <clears throat> then you know I, I think in in terms of what this team can do, I'll be a lot more confident than I've been first seven games of the season where it looked like it was a downward trend. Yeah, Dana, what what was your thoughts as well? Obviously, big win of course, and I don't even want to mention Sunderland by the way, Tom. Just 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 because I know it's like a, an instant L, like because of Morbury, like it's the Morbury factor. So that game for me just doesn't exist. Uh, but Dana, what what, <laughs> what was your thoughts and assessments of yesterday? I Appreciate that. Or winning away from home is, is still a, a quite a an amazing feat. I think, it was, I think it was March. I think the last time we won away from home. So um, yeah, big win. It was, yeah, and that game was chaos. But it was mutual chaos in that Borough got a lot of joy from Watford and Watford got a lot of joy from Borough. I will say, though, we deserved the win. Absolutely deserved the win. I think we were the better team. 
But it, yeah, it was just complete chaos. It was one of those games that you couldn't really take your eyes off. Um, otherwise, you would have missed something, as I did several times, trying to book somewhere to have a palm or today. But yeah, it was it was one of the it was one of those games where it makes you feel good about Borough going forward, but it does worry you defensively because Watford allowed us so much space in midfield. I mean, I don't even think they had one, to be honest, at times. The the goals that we scored, though, were so well-crafted. Like that first one where Johnny Howson turns Tom Deli Bashiru, and you could tell that he meant that. I think it was maybe mentioned on commentary that it was a misplaced pass or something, and I, I watched the replays as I heard that. I was like, that that was so intentional from House, and he, 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 you know, he, he was wanting to do that uh, and then the ball through to McGree it was fantastic it was brilliant from uh, Daniel Backman to let Riley McGree score there to just simply step aside to I mean if we're going into the praise of place I think you've got to put Dan Backman in there from a Borough perspective and then that second one as well from Dieng to McGree to Crooks back to McGree um, that goal pretty much epitomised Watford actually because when you see McGree receive the ball if you keep watching him obviously he goes out of the frame but if you watch him as he re-enters the frame and he obviously accelerates to the 18 yard box there's a good like five or six seconds where he is not picked up and for a championship team that is pretty criminal but Borough got a lot of joy from those quick transitions just allowing the ball to be very quickly played from defense to attack I think it was um very um we we were just very to the point in that game I think a very insensitive, insensitive. No, that's not the word. Anyway, forget it. It was just a very good performance from us in terms of attacking, but defensively, obviously, we need work. But it doesn't matter because you know that was obviously a, a very good three points, and psychologically, I think it was very good as well because to go to a team that you haven't had the best of fortunes against over the past decade or so, I think it's a big, um, big tick in the box there. Yeah, I felt like it was coming last year until like they all scored right at the end and we got beat 2-1. Uh, yeah, I was expecting that to happen again, to be fair. I was like, where's this Watford winner coming from and which which of their shittest players are going to score it? Yeah, and just on the goals you mentioned there, Dan, I think I, just wanna, I wanna go back to the to the house and uh, turn because he 100% mean, means this because when you break the goal down and it, it's actually it's entirety, um, you'll see that he doesn't look once when the ball gets played to Hackney when or Brian's got the ball. He doesn't look once. He looks twice. So he's looking, he's looking again. He's just constantly looking where his man is, looking for his space. He looks a third time. And then you're thinking, right, he's got some space. He's still looking again. And when he does get the ball uh, from O'Brien, he's already thinking of this Cruyff turn. So he Cruyff's turn, Cruyff turns and then he takes out four players just from one turn, and then we have so much space to go forward, and he lays a lovely ball through to Riley McGree, and then McGree, and then you just mentioned their backman there. Riley McGree has pretty much a whole goal to aim for because Backman has stood right on his post, but then still proceeds to shoot at Backman. He dives the wrong way and Borough score, um, which is absolutely insane. But the turn from Housen is superb. It's brilliant. He just takes out four men. It's all from really just from always looking over your shoulder. I know it's like very simple stuff that you you taught when you're a kid to also cover your shoulder, look where you are in space. You can kind of make your own decisions there. But brilliant from House and Pooh from Watford. And then Bora go on to celebrate and haha Jamal Lewis. Um because <laughs> you know his comments early in the in, in the week saying that they have to go very Kevin Keegan esque saying they've got to go to search Mills and get something, but we did get something and haha to Jamal Lewis. But then on the second goal as well, then I just want to like kind of point out on the on the space that Watford had and kind of like the expansiveness because on the goal kick in itself, when, when Dieng does kick the ball, there was a huge gap between Louisa and uh, the, the centre half. Um, and when you would expect really when the way that they set up Watford in probably in that, it is kind of like a five, but it's kind of like a, a shape as a V. Um, and you think, right, they've got enough space there, but the space, that they, uh, they've got, sorry, they're occupying quite a lot of space in the wide areas, which Borough like to play out in, um, but the middle of the park where this is where distribution is so key, isn't it? Uh, when we talk about like Dieng and his strengths and what Stefan was able to do last year, just pick Riley McCree out, didn't he? Just picked him out. Lovely touch. Borough are already where they've already broke the press. There's so much space running behind to 4v4 and Borough, you know, slot away and we were in with, with 2-0 uh, to the good and obviously I don't want to talk about the, you know how they were able to come back in the game but Tom three wins in a row now 
is this the corner? Is this the corner that we finally turned, or are we still on about ninety five percent of the way to to like getting around that bend? I mean, you'd hope so. Uh, I, I hope we'd have a, a definitive answer on that by the end of of this coming week. Um, but like I said earlier, definite signs of progress. We're doing the basics right a lot more. And just to, to come back to something you mentioned last week in terms of a lot of the summer signings not playing, it, it's a very kind of settled lineup. I am now wondering if that is having more of an effect on on doing the basics right than you know trying to fit, say, Rogers, Silvera, etc., into the team and have them do exactly the same thing. Maybe it was the case early in the season that they weren't fully used to our style of play yet, and these signings we're probably going to see coming to the team more one at a time uh, moving forward. But I'm happy with the settled team that we have at the moment. We seem to be doing things right. Um, you know, Housen and Hackney are absolutely running things in midfield. So, yeah, hopefully that continues and uh, we, we fully turn this corner. Yeah, and the game yesterday, I thought it was quite expansive as well. Obviously, we're turning the corner, but I know teams aren't going to probably give us that much space um, going forward. It was an expansive game yesterday. Uh, Denny, you did mention that a little bit earlier on, but do you think games like that really do just help Borough massively because of just how good we are going forward with the ball? Yeah, and I think we've got the players to be able to really exploit those spaces. Like Riley McGree, for example, is very good at picking up key pockets and space between the the, um, the defensive line and the midfield line. And I mean, yeah, Watford did not have a midfield yesterday. It was very odd. Obviously, with with Imran Loser, I've heard a lot from Watford fans that on his day he's a very very good midfielder, but that his day doesn't come around too too often. I think from what we've seen of him yesterday, he's not the one that's going to necessarily track back and. I expected, I actually wrote in one of my questions in my notes, did Borough win the midfield battle? I mean, there wasn't really a battle to be won because Watford didn't have a midfield and it was very odd the way that they set up. I think Valerian Ishmael said afterwards that he got it wrong. There was a spell in the second half where they did improve and I think their midfield, they actually gained one. But yeah, I think playing that kind of way suits Borough because we have the players to be able to get into those spaces that are dangerous where, you know, the likes of Hackney really can dictate a football match if you allow him that room <clears throat> and, you know, Watford did. So it was a fun game to watch from that point of view, obviously because of Borough, it, it was kind of a game of Watford's lack of midfield and Borough's lack of a defence. So it was, yeah, it was a, one of those where, as I said, they give us a lot and we give them a lot, but Borough did look a lot more incisive. That was the word that I was trying to find before going forward. And previously this season, I think we have been slow. We've been a little bit predictable. And now that's one of the signs that we're seeing a progression that Borough are now moving the ball quicker and we're actually getting joy from it. So yeah, there are indications of the team from last season that going forward, were very dangerous, but it will be interesting to see if this sticks because, yeah, Watford were poor. So that's why at the top of the show, I didn't, I, I, I don't want to say what Borough's ceiling is or whether we have fully turned the corner, but as it was put very well on Twitter, I think we've shot the indicators on. So that's that's very good. It is. Um, but on the, on the other side, uh, Tom, uh, <laughs> defensive errors again. I mean, it wouldn't be a Borough match if we didn't, you know, shoot ourselves in the foot multiple times. Um, you know, obviously the first goal, Dale Fry gets caught, just doesn't really know what to do with his body um, or hands or whatever he wants to do. He's, he's just so confused. Um, but this, the second goal, obviously, again, it's kind of like a nine times out of ten that goes over the bar in the stands and that one time it, it does go in the top corner. Um, but how do we tighten things up? Because this has just been such a... A long standing issue, and I know we've had the goal scorers to kind of you know get us out of trouble. And and to be honest, if you win every game 2 1, you, you still you know have maximum points. But how do you tighten things up from, from a borough perspective? I mean, I, I wish I knew because I thought overall our defensive performance wasn't that bad yesterday. The first goal, very unlucky from <laughs> for, from Fry, I think. to to get caught out like that, um, 
it's probably to be expected that that would be the type of goal that they score, given their manager is always had quite a direct style. Um, and you know, we've seen that at, uh, at Barnsley and West Brom. So, but I mean, it it looked a difficult ball to defend. Um, I suppose it it just comes down to kind of decision making there. And obviously, Fry's made the made the wrong one. Um, felt a bit bad for uh, for Dieng as well because I thought he did look very close to saving that. He, he'd covered the angle well. He'd gone down for the one on one, fairly similar style as you know Stefan did last season, and I think both of them do fairly well in saving one on ones. So yeah, it was um, it was a tough one for that. And then then the second one, like you say, nine times out of ten that goes out over the bar. He's hit that well. Um, Again, we, we've initially cleared the uh, cleared the danger from the corner. I suppose it's just kind of pushing out to him to to make sure that he doesn't even get that option to to shoot. Um, I've not really kind of watched that goal back, so I don't know who was closest. But you know, I think in the last couple of last couple of games, our defensive pressing um, we usually there within kind of two or three seconds of, if not sooner, of someone getting the ball. I think that's the way to be going. Maybe that could have prevented that second goal if there if there was someone around. I suppose it's just being a little bit more alert to us. And like I say, it was decision making for the first. But I, overall performance yesterday, I didn't think that was too too bad. Um, just it seems to be these individual errors. Um, and and like I say, just just a bit of luck for for the second one. I thought. Yeah, and I think just on the pressing side of things that like you mentioned in there, like it has got better. Like I, look, I was looking, I was looking uh, at the borough's like pressing per defensive action uh, figures, and actually over like the last couple of games, it started to come down quite a bit. Whereas previously, where we, our pressing kind of fell off a cliff, um, it's actually got a little bit better from the previous game. So I think it's, it definitely, obviously, the data backs up what you're seeing on the eye test as well, which is good. Um, but going forward, I kind of want to single out uh, a player, Dana, um, because you mentioned it. In our group chat last night, you're like, Johnny, please, can we talk about Ryan McGree? Um, I can't really say the explicit uh, voice nor that you, you said. Um, but I'll, I'll just say, Dana, Dana Moll, Ryan McGree, discuss. Um, and I'll let you show your love for, for the Australian. Yeah, he is just a fantastic footballer. Honestly, so joyous to watch him. Very silky in possession of the ball and very intelligent too. When Riley McGree first broke into this Middlesbrough team, when he had 48 on his back and he was the competition to my darling Marcus Tavernier, he didn't have that composure because, much like Tav, actually, whenever you saw him line up a shot, you could kind of expect that it was probably going to end up in red car in the, you know, at home games. And now I think he's sorted that out and he looks a lot more calm at that final part of his game and he's definitely added to that he's so intelligent even watching him out of possession just scan Riley McGree all game and he will be in a good position to be able to receive a pass and he is what knits this Middlesbrough attack together in my opinion in the absence of Akpom who did a lot of that last season Riley McGree has really really stepped up and our top scorer this season he's adding goals to his game he's always had that creativity he's a very good ball carrier he's you know he takes those spaces in between the lines and he hurts teams because of that as I said always an option for that pass when Borough are stuck Riley McGree is there he's just a fantastic footballer and it's brilliant to see that he has developed quite a lot he's obviously had to bide his time and being in the team last season, he was he was a very good player for us. But I think he's definitely amped that up this season. It's just a honestly, it's just a joy to watch him. And I will say, Hayden Hackney is very similar in that he's just got that nice playing style that is good to watch. As I said earlier, very good ball control, and the ball is it never gets away from him. The two of them are brilliant to watch. But Randy McGray, you're going to ask Tom it. I'm going to answer it for myself. I think he's our best player. Oh, well, Tom, do you think he's our best player as well? Yes. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> there we go. That's not the answer we wanted. Um, well, wh- why do you think he's, uh, he's our best player, Tom? Pretty much everything Dan has just said there, I, f- I think is in his development from, from where he was uh, a couple of seasons ago, he, he looks like a different player. 
Um, so good on the ball. The fact that he's adding goals to his game as well and really stepping up in the absence of, of Akpom this season. We've needed it. Um, I'm a little bit wary of us becoming kind of like a, a one-player team again because now I'm wondering, you know, if McGree gets injured, who's stepping up to to fill that role? Um, as Dan said there, Hayden Hackney is not too far behind in terms of being exciting to, to watch on the ball. And obviously, he's got a goal himself, which was phenomenal this year, but I'm not sure he's the player to, to fill that gap from, from McGree yet. But... I feel like to do that, we're going to need a, a few players to kind of step up in terms of their development. You know, it's taken Riley McGree two years uh, ish to to get to this point. Um, you know, potentially looking a bit further down the line for for other players as well. But yeah, we, we need more than than McGree to kind of carry us through games. So, although he is our best player, um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. We need other players to to step up and make it a, an argument and a, a conversation about who our best player is. It's crazy yeah, that it... Carrick didn't have him in the team at the beginning of the season. I think his explanation for that was that he was trying to find the right balance of the team. You're never going to find the right balance of the team when you leave out your best player. So it's good that he's back in the team now and he's showing why he should be there. Yeah, and, and just for me as well, like you've, you've, you've all mentioned it, but he's, he's for me, he just floats like a little butterfly just on the pitch. Just like He's just so elegant and just how he just able to find just pockets of space and just really influence a game and I know there's a lot of it where like you know, there's some tactical tactical bits to it but the application of how he plays and how he's able to create overloads create space and also his, his passing is, is being excellent as well and for me just full of praise for him I, I think he's just been Boris but I know you you guys have said he bit hasn't been Boris best player not best, it's taken about two years to get to it at this point I think I've said in this podcast before and multiple times, like he is, he's just our best player by country mile. Um, really is. And I know we, we all love Hayden Hackney, etc. But I just think he's just, it's just, just a level above. And maybe he doesn't get the, the, um, the, the praise that he deserved last year because of his numbers in terms of like goals and assists. But now that he's starting to add to that, that only does one thing and that increases his price tag, doesn't it? And I think we can, we could make a lot of money on Ryan McGree if, the 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 standout figures of the world of goals and assists start to increase even more. But for me, he just he adds so much to his game, and it's fantastic. But speaking of goals, though, there was a player that got his first goal of the season. It was Josh Corburn, uh, Tom, and he's been leading the line for the last couple of games. They've been a bit effective performances, but and also in his team, it's been called the stick man. Um, <laughs> so I'm assuming that even means the ball sticks to him because he's definitely not skinny because he's on TRT for sure. Um, but what, why do you, how, can we, how can we get the best out of Josh Corbin while he's in the team at the moment? I think just use him the way we are using him at the moment. Um, I've said plenty of times before on, on the pod, like I always enjoy watching like uh, a team use a target man. I think yesterday he did have a, a tough game. Uh, up against Sierra Alta and uh, and Porteous, um especially, I, th- I thought they were they were giving him a, a very physical battle in terms of holding the holding the ball up, um, and like I said before, five minutes before he scored, I was thinking let's take him off and put Ladell laugh on. Very different type type of striker can run at those defenders and and potentially get a get one of them sent off, and then it's you know. A, well, I'd say an easier game for us, but as we all know, it's uh, much harder to play against ten men. So, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I was thinking that, but he he popped up with with his moment and got the goal. Uh, obviously, delighted for him, and <clears throat> uh, hopefully, we can continue to use him in the same way because we're missing, uh, you know, in terms of link up play uh, since since Akpom left. We're, we're kind of missing that that link up from from one of our strikers, and Corburn could be the one to come in and fill that role, even if it's not typically not typically the same position as Akpom was playing, as that would would technically be Crooks, but he's got that link up play uh, to utilise. So <clears throat> I, I think you know continue using him in that vein going forward. Um, I, I think that's going to help bring others into the game and and open things up quite a lot. Yeah, and just yesterday as well. I'll see as as the game was was getting a little bit, I would say stagnant, and and we're getting on top a little bit more. 
I know you were saying, Tom, as well, that Tate Colburn and was it Tate Colburn off and then he went and scored. So um would you have liked to see like a laugh come on though to maybe stretch the game a little bit further? Because it, it kind of felt like there was there's a lack of pace in that Watford line, but can you try and exploit it? And do you think you would have you would have probably impacted the game quite well? I, I still think so. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying there. There was a lack of pace in, in that Watford defensive line. You put someone like that they laugh on, he's either going to get in behind and get a chance or he'll be pulled back by one of them because they can't keep up with him and they'll end up getting sent off. Um, it could have been for, for Coburn or Crooks, to be fair, uh, that change. But I still think that that change could have um, impacted the game. Just turns out we didn't need it to five minutes later, so um, you know there was there was no need for that sub uh, in the end. But at that point, where we maybe needed to inject a little bit of pace into the game, that could have been a good idea. Yeah, and although there was loads of positives yesterday, and just before, as we round off uh, Watford, now there was an injury, and that left back position just seems to be cursed again. Dana, I know you were high of praise of O'Brien last week, and we also mentioned that we used him out of position as well. But now we might not be using him at all uh, because yeah. he's injured. Uh, how big of a miss do you think it'll be? And also, who occupies that position next? Because is it too early for Engel to come back? I feel like it is because if it wasn't, he probably would have been played yesterday, right? But. Tommy Smith came on and Rav Vandenberg shifted to the left. I will say massive credit to Rav Vandenberg, being 19 years old, playing out of position on the opposite side to his his favoured side. And defensively, he looks really astute, really composed and crucially really mature as well, in knowing when to probably press onto, a, uh, onto an attacker and when to stay, stay off a little bit. Um, there was one moment where he did get done by, I can't remember who it was, we just got a little bit, um, probably a little bit dazzled. Um, but he's definitely a good player, and and there's signs that he's he, he could well play there for the foreseeable. It, but yeah, when Lewis O'Brien went down, and you could tell that he was he, he wasn't going to continue. I was like, who did that? Because they will pay. And I think it was Yara Spree, wasn't it? Um, he's on the Ryan Man in hit list for. <laughs> crocking one of my favourite players because I, I think Lewis O'Brien is, is fantastic. I know he's only been here for what feels like five minutes, but yeah, he's he's uh, one of my favourite players just because I, I love that type of midfielder, that all energy box to box. Um, and obviously playing in that left back role, it, it suits him, I think, because he is so good technically. Defensively, there's going to be patches in his game, of course, because he's not a left back, as I mentioned last week, but it's going to be a big mess, I think. But it's going to throw up a lot of questions of who plays left back. But I think Ralph Vandenberg might have answered a lot of them from his performances at, at, you know, in that position. So I think he will probably end up playing, playing there. Okay, then. and then just finally on on Watford as well. I just want to, as we move, just before I move into questions as well, what do we think of Watford? Because we, I was on uh, one of their phones, uh, not actually ringing in, just saying Watford crap. Um, I was just listening. <laughs> that's like I was like, hmm, I wonder what they think about Watford at the moment. And all of them were suggesting suggesting that it's re- League One, it's relegation, very similar to what Bora fans uh, were were saying only last just last week as well. Um, but what was our collective thoughts on them, Tom? Because they were leaving a lot of space and defensively they just looked uh, very suspect. And going forward, they weren't particularly great either. But what, what's your thoughts on them? I mean, my thoughts are they don't need to worry about relegation. They're going to have about four different managers before then. One of them will get it right and save them. So, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's the one. Yeah, 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 so, um, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I thought yesterday they, they were very open. They did leave a, a, a lot of space. I, I thought, you know, that first goal where Housen took the entire midfield out with one turn. I was like, how was that happening? And none of the defence are pressing up to it. Because it felt like that ball was in no man's land for a, a good five minutes before Housen even got there as well. Like, how was no one even attack, attack that and try to get it? it? It does seem like that's a very different type of play to what Watford have, have been used to in the past, the, the whole direct approach. And, you know, I, I suppose even for all his faults, you look at them under Chris Wilder at the end of last season where he was coming out and pretty much slating them every week, saying half the, half the players aren't really asked and stuff like that. I'm just like, is there something more going on at that club? Um, 
But, you know, like I said, there, there were four different managers to go yet. So who knows where they'll end up. Yeah, it's, it's how I like kind of like know what like um what season it is. Do you know what I mean? If it's like autumn, like they've got one manager, they'll, you know, if it's summer, they'll go for like someone who's just meant to be good and isn't like it's, it's just all great for being a Watford fan, you know. Um, but then what's your thoughts on them as well? Would you be concerned if you were a Watford fan? Not really. I think they're a team that will probably just be going through the motions this season and treading war, as people like to say. They'll be mid-table, I think. There's worse teams in the championship than them. So although it was a performance where, yes, their midfield was pretty much non-existent and that did throw up a lot of troubles for them, I think they'll be fine. So, yeah. I mean, football fans are very extreme and very emotional, aren't they? So I'm not surprised that there's opinions like that after that type of defeat and that performance, but they'll be fine, I think. Yeah, I agree as well. I think there'll be a lot of mid-table this year. There's there's definitely like a, a rebuild or um, a restructuring going on. You know, they've sold a lot of key assets now in comparison to the previous year. Things will take time for them to, to come again. But yeah, I know, I know it's very, very early, but for me, mid to lower table, unless they go on a really outrageous run, which I, just, I can't really see at the moment. Uh, two suspect at the back, and I think they just need a couple more players to fit the manager's style for them to really get going. But anyway, that's enough about Watford. Now let's move on to podcast questions. Ah, yes, podcast questions. Every week you get the chance to send us your podcast question uh, by Twitter, Bora underscore breakdown, email the Bora breakdown at hotmail.com or by joining our Telegram chat. We were 360 Bora fans chatting everything but Bora. We actually did chat about Bora yesterday because a lot of happy Bora fans in there, um, of course. But this first question is from Gary. Um, oh, and by the way, congratulations to Gary's, by the way, because the name is back on the up. Uh, if no one's seen oh. the BBC Tees, yes, it was going to be extinct very soon. Um, but now it's on, it's on the up again. Uh, so, <laughs> um, there you are. There's your Gary news for the week. Um, so <laughs> do his question though was, do you, do you guys think our center backs are actually any good? Um, Dana, do you think our centre backs are any good? I do, but sometimes they don't show that, do they? I mean, Lenahan definitely is. I still believe Fry is, but others will have different opinions. I think Johnny, you have a different opinion, but I think they are. It's just <laughs> yeah. that they're not showing it. But it's kind of like how long do you give it before this the defensive errors in moments becomes just a part of them and a part of their game that's the question but I don't know Johnny thoughts yeah I just I, I know you were saying about Dale Fry. I, just, I know everyone says that he's our best defender club I actually don't think he is at all um I think Lenahan is our best defender I would also like to see Rav Vandenberg uh at a centre half as well because for me he just looks really really good and he'll take time and of course get better but for me i just really really like him i'm interested to see what matt clark does when he comes back or if uh, as and when he does come back um and paddy mcnair played well there yesterday as well i know he's a bit suspect sometimes but like some of our uh, defenders are but the reason why we're suspect at the back at times is just the way we play sometimes i think our midfield kind of leaves them for dead so sometimes i would maybe like us to go with like a 4-1-4-1 where you've got someone just like control, like just just protecting the, the the defense. You've got your four midfielders there who can play a bit more advanced and try to cut open teams. And if we're playing a much more pressing style, and that would suit us. But I think it's just yeah, our centre backs are okay. The the decent, and I think we're getting to a lot of championship sides. But I think the way that we play is the reason why we give quite a lot up. But we do make a lot of individual mistakes and. For Dale Fry as well, I know it's just for him to get better. And it's not like me slagging him off and saying he's the worst defender in the world. I don't think that at all. I just think that I would like him to go back to when we first came in. When he first came into the Millsbury, right? And he was known as like a, a much better ball player in centre half. He's turned from that to a hoop, like a proper stopper and like someone just loves to hoof the ball and it frustrates a hell of me because he had everything yeah. there to do it. I, um, I wonder but, where that came from the whole like ball playing thing because I was thinking about yeah. this yesterday like was it communicated to us through like the Gazette or something like it who was... said who said it that Dale Fry because like yeah. obviously I, I I have I'm with you like I remember this being said but I can't remember who said it yeah might have been was who a... was manager when he came through because you know Karanka. his debut was under Karanka and then we had that 
well, they had Gary Monk trying to do that style of play. It didn't really necessarily mm. work out a lot. And then, obviously, on the, on the Pulis, Woodgate, Warnock eras, where I suppose hoofing the ball was more of a necessity. So, you know, mm. m- maybe that's where the change happens. But, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I also remember the ball playing centre-back thing, but can't remember who said it. Yeah. We need to get to the yeah. bottom of this, don't we? We need to get we, we, out and really detective do. Nancy Drew cosplay out and see who <laughs> who uh, who said that. Yeah, odd, isn't it? It's just odd. Um, but for me, I would like to st- when Matt Clark's fit again. I would just like to see Matt Clark and Leonard Hannah centre half. Just, just, just keen. Just, just keen to see it, you know. Uh, but who, what am I to know? I'm just a podcaster. Uh, so the next question uh, is from Jam. I don't know if it's like strawberry or raspberry jam, but it's just known as Jam. Um, it says, uh, Will oh, Crooks. Oh, oh, Jamie, yes. I, just, <laughs> I just, you never know. You never know. You never know these days. Uh, but Will Crooks now get the credit he deserves. Tom, and I'll, then I'll ask for your thoughts as well, but Tom, do you think Crooks will get the credit he deserves? I mean, who knows? Because it's one extra. He was good yesterday. Crooks. He, he was. He's had a last uh, a good last couple of games, so he'll be getting praised again. But obviously, he wasn't for about seven games before that. He was last year when you know he was coming as an impact sub and scoring goals. I, f- I feel like with Crooks, it's either he's going to get praised, and then there's going to be people saying, "Well, oh, he doesn't deserve that praise because he's only come off the bench and scoring," or he's going to get slated and and. You know, people saying no, he's he's putting in all the effort and and uh, and getting you know put, well, not really kind of doing much for that effort as well. But what can't be ignored is you know he's he's had some great moments in the team, um, and he's had a lot of impact uh, in those moments. So he's got he's got the ability. I just feel like with Matt Crooks especially, it's. It's it's very much one extreme or the other in terms of opinions. Uh, there's never going to be a, a consistent amount of of credit with, that gets thrown as well. Dana, just because he's always on your Christmas tree, um, do you think he deserves uh, more credit? Weirdly, my dad's actually on the top of the Christmas tree. Um, I put Matt Crooks Excuse on the, on a bauble. Um, yeah, there's a cut out of my dad's face that I put on the. Oh, right, okay, yeah. so I don't I just, I just put my dad on top of the Christmas tree. <laughs> I was like, one, how small has Dave got? Uh, and two, why is it on top of a tree? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, yeah, I love Matt Crooks. I do. I think he's a very effective player. And so I said this on Tease yesterday. Sometimes he can look shit, but then other times he can look really good. And it just depends on what year, what day it is with with crooks or what week it is sometimes he's good sometimes he just looks like nothing's working for him you know his touch is heavy his ball controls poor he's making the poor selection of passes but yesterday was one of those games where crooks was on it and it was brilliant to see because he could still have a, a big part to play in this team and we saw that yesterday so he was good and he deserves the credit uh, whether or not that credit will continue into other games, that depends on his performance. So, yeah, I absolutely love him. I'll always give him credit where it's due because I just, yeah, I love the guy. But he was fantastic yesterday. I think he was probably probably my man of the match, I would say. Okay. Fair enough. And I just want to say, uh, Dave, Dana also loves you as as, as well. Uh, just, just, just not, <laughs> not as, as much, much as Matt Crooks. As Matt Crooks. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I'm glad that we clarified that. Uh, but let's move on. Let's move on to uh, Borough Breakdown shirt time because just to let you know, our Borough Breakdown shirt is now back on sale. Uh, available for a very limited time. It's a beautiful uh, blue and uh, black shirt. And, you know, everyone's saying it's so great. And also, um, it's just a. Uh, Say the only shirt that will click um, is when you click to buy it. So and it won't click all because the quality is just that good. Uh, so you've got to say, it and we're going to buy area. it. But, yeah, have that. Um, so anyway, all sorts of bit of news as well that we are. If you haven't seen as well, we are nominated and we are in the final uh, in the football content awards as well. So second year in a row uh, that we've been nominated for best podcast in the AFL. So big thank you uh, to everyone that voted for us. But if you haven't voted yet and you want to know how to vote, here's how. 
So the first way to vote for the Borough Breakdown for best podcast in the Football League is to head to the Football Content Awards website, www.footballcontentawards.com forward slash voting. There'll be a drop down menu. If you scroll down to best podcast, we are part of the Football League category. Select the Borough Breakdown, then check that little terms and conditions box that nobody actually seems to pay attention to, but we just check it anyway to get rid of the process and then click on vote now you don't need to fill out any other category just that one and it'll count as a vote the second way to vote is to tweet i am voting or underscore breakdown in the fcas for best podcast in brackets football league now there will be a way to auto tweet this just to make the whole thing 10 times easier for you we'll shot the link to that in the description of this video the third and final way to vote for us is to tag us in the comments of the Football Content Awards Instagram post regarding the best podcast football league. We will put the link to that in the description. Ah, yes, the praise and place. The only place that we like to give uh, praise to a player, coach and staff member, the board breakdown show, the FCAs. And... Um, Johnny Houston's Cruyff turn yesterday. There we go. That'll round things <laughs> quite nicely for the praise and place this week. Uh, but guys, who gets your place in the praise and place this week? Uh, Dinner Malt, you can go first. Who's in your praise and place? Yeah, so Crooks, firstly, as I mentioned there, I thought he was very, very good yesterday. I'm going to put in uh, Rav Vandenberg as well for stepping in at left back. I want to praise Senny Dieng as well because we haven't mentioned him too much on this. I know Tommy mentioned him earlier in, in regards to the Watford game, but I thought he was very good yesterday. And someone on Tease yesterday said that he's a downgrade on Stefan. I mean, I don't know if you can say he's an upgrade, but he's definitely not a downgrade. I think he's um, probably similar quality level to Stefan, in my opinion, in terms of fitting into this team. His distribution is very good. I think he's ability to see like a shot stop is very good and his commanding is good and all around I think he's a very good goalkeeper Sally Diang and he's one of those pick pickups this summer where Borough have got it right I think and I'm a little bit unnerved that he hasn't yet gone through a period where you really really question him because it always seems to happen with a goalkeeper that may still be to come but for now I think Sally Diang has been a fantastic summer signing for us and yesterday I Oh, he was he was brilliant and was definitely a key part in Borough retaining that need once we had um, acquired it and obviously seeing the game out. I think I thought he was very very good. Congratulations to Sam Biang and, and Rav Vandenberg. Uh, Tom, who was in your praise and place this week? I think for me, I want to praise both the centre mids from yesterday. I thought Housen and Hackney did an incredible job of of running things in the midfield. Obviously helped that Watford's midfield was pretty much non-existent, but um, yeah, House and Hackney did great. I think Hackney again is is looking better every game and really silencing the uh, the critics of earlier in the season where they were like, "I just need to kind of take out the the team for a bit." He's you know, in, 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 uh, young player in his his second season. Um, I, I just think he looks better all the time, and also want to praise. Isaiah Jones. Um, I, I think he again was looking really positive yesterday. Um, a lot of goods into playing and getting in behind to to try and get the crosses in. Again, looking better all the time. He's looking um, like he's going to be getting back to his best. And I, I think nothing kind of like summed that up more than just going back a week when he got subbed off against Southampton. Uh, obviously, went off at the closest point of exit from the pitch and then got pretty much a stand ovation by most of the east and, and north stand so yeah I, I, I think he's looking better all the time as well and really looking forward to seeing more from Isaiah Jones in the next couple of games. Can I add someone to the prison place real quick? I want to put Tommy Smith in there for immediately coming onto the pitch and then standing on <laughs> a spree. I think that was a have that. That was probably the retribution actually for crocking Lewis O'Brien. But yeah, you like kind of stoned him up, like pushed him. I don't even know what happened, but Yaris B was on the floor. Uh, so I thought that was a bit of a shithouse moment there from Tommy Smith, who is on the radar for Shithouse Island if he's not already on there. Mm. 
Yeah, I think it's definitely a moment where I feel like we need to take it to the panel, I think, and and understand, understand if he actually is, is deserving of, of the place of Shadow Island. But we'll come to that on the next episode of the World Breakdown podcast because we'll discuss it, we'll review it, we'll watch the clip and footage again, but we'll see if uh, he, he comes into the first uh, first member of the Shadow Island for, for the season. Um, but yeah, for me, I'm going to go with Rav Vandenberg, definitely brilliant performance again i'm really really impressed by rav vandenberg and then secondly i'll go riley mcgree i think he was brilliant yesterday it was the difference uh for us going forward really silky and i know we gave him a lot of praise earlier but yeah for me just uh, he has to be in my present place uh this week but let's move on let's chat about cardiff now um because the last time Cardiff came to borough uh, we we got beat three two uh, when chris wilder was in charge uh the last time we played cardiff in a game and uh, we won three one uh, with Force Archer and McGree scoring. But it's time for some Borough versus Cardiff trivia now. Um, so let's do some trivia. Now, let's do some music to kind of set the mood uh, as, as we will. Um, but the first question, guys, uh, for you around uh, Borough versus Cardiff trivia was what year was the first game between Borough and Cardiff? Um, Dana Mott, what do you think? Hmm. I really think about this one. I've had it in my head 1912. It's incorrect. Um, oh, Tom, uh, what year was it? What year was Boris Cardiff's first game? I'm going to go a bit sooner than that and say 1951. So the answer is 1921 oh. uh, and Cardiff won a 3 1. We all know how that game turned out because uh, we were all there, uh, um, of course, <laughs> in, in 1921. <laughs> um, but the second question of Borough trivia uh, this week, and I know everyone was sat probably in the house on the walks and thinking, oh, God, I remember that 1921 game. Uh, but in 2011, uh, Borough beat Cardiff away from home uh, three goals to two. Uh, but can you name the scorers for Borough that day? Um, Tom, I'll let you go first on this one since Dana went first on the last one. I'm going to go Richie Smallwood, mm-hmm. Scott McDonald, and I think Marvin Emnes. You've got one out of the possible three. Um, so you got Scott McDonald correct uh, on the one, but Zena, can you get the other two? What month was it in 2011? I don't know. <laughs> you don't have that in the north. <laughs> <laughs> what a crap host. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um... <laughs> oh. Gonna have to I rush don't you know, in. I don't know, Jeff. I don't know, Jeff. Someone will completely left feel like Bartok Betcher. He did score that game, right? Mm hmm. Did score that game, yeah. Did score. Oh, who was the other one? So the answer is Scott McDonald, Bartok Betcher. And Faris Haroon uh, gave uh, all it was all three points uh, and all three goals. And Tony Mowbray went home a very, very happy man. So shout out to Faris Haroon. Um, but let's go to this season then, because Cardiff were one of the favourites to get relegated this season, but they've made a fantastic start uh, under life with uh, Errol Bullet. Um, you know, they are sixth now and in the championship. They've won the last five league games as well, really on a good bit of run of form. And how do they really play? A little bit different from what you were expecting him from when he was uh, managing in Turkey, where it was more like a strong defensive unit. Very simplistic, get the ball out of, of play, no, no nonsense defending. But really, it's more like the pressing and also like the hitting teams on the transition is where he's brought over uh, to the championship this season. It's reflected in their possession day where they're averaging about 39% uh, this season. But they are creating chances when they need to, getting teams on the transition and really doing well in that 4-2-3-1 shape. Um, but when you look at them 
for the players to watch out for. I think Ugbo, who was uh, used to be a Chelsea um, Academy graduate, who isn't a Chelsea Academy graduate, uh, went out on loan. He's came back to England and very, very well up top. Um, Carl Grant, of course, who's came on loan from West Bromwich Albion. And Aaron Ramsey, not the Aaron Ramsey of Middlesbrough, um, the Aaron Ramsey of we all thought of, of, of all thought of when Borough mentioned and linked with Aaron Ramsey and was like, wow, we're bringing that Welsh midfielder. We brought the other one <laughs> from Aston Villa. <laughs> <laughs> that Aaron Ramsey that we're on about. Um but obviously their their team is, is you know doing incredibly well this season. But Borough haven't got the best of records when they do play at Cardiff. I always think of that game in the FA Cup when they came and the beat us where we should have really got to the semi-final that year, but we never. Um but what's our predictions for the game, guys? Because this could be a really, really difficult game Tuesday tonight at the Riverside. Um, you know, with with both teams probably still wanting to be in good form and try to get a win. But Tom, what's your prediction uh, for the game? I'm going to one borough. Um, I still haven't got to the point where I think we're going to keep a clean sheet just yet. I think we we will concede, but we've got enough in, in the team to to turn it back around and, and get a 2-1 win. Okay. Uh, and Dana, who are you going to go for? I think 1-0 borough. Just a very tight game but we do keep a clean sheet oh okay um well tom uh, before i come to you in just one moment i'm going to predict a, a one nil mills per win i'm going to go for um and just think you know what we deserve a win so we're going to get one uh but tom i'm going to add a little feature to to this podcast because every week you you love um a daryl anahan anytime so i'm going to ask you uh, what's your tom bet uh for the game against cardiff well, I mean, that's changed now. Um, and what I went for yesterday was over 1.5 goals, Van Den Berg anytime, and always something on corners to put the odds up. So, yeah, it's going to be the same until Van Den Berg scores. It's going to be Van Den Berg anytime and over 1.5 goals, probably. Fantastic, fantastic betting tips. Um, from you it's there, not. Tom, but that's it's <laughs> not no. So please don't put your life savings on that. Please, the love of God, don't do it. Um, <laughs> please don't. And uh, but yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much uh, for joining me as always. And to the listeners and the viewers, thank you very much for listening to us and watching us on YouTube as well. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on YouTube and also rate our podcast five stars. And don't forget to vote for us in the FC as we've showed you how. And also with all the links that are going to be in the podcast description as well. But Bora have give their Bora have give their, their fans some tea. LC and creep creeping up the table but don't go chasing waterfalls this has been the board breakdown podcast and that was like a board match their chatter in a pod up the board breakdown <laughs>